Hello, wizard tribe. It is I, Dev, back, finally, after a week of glorious combat in the arena with my tiger companion, Julie, and I have emerged a changed man. Not really. I can't do that voice for 20 minutes. I'm sorry I can't commit to a character for very long, but I'm mostly just wearing this for comedic effect, but also because I don't want you to see the entirety of my hair. It looks very bad right now. This looks better than my hair, if that tells you anything, because this looks really stupid. But also, Julie is still down here. There she is. Yeah, get up. <laughs> anyway, the reason you, you can't see most of the cats nowadays is because I'm a big dude. I don't know if you've noticed uh, how long you've been watching the channel. It's kind of tough to spot, but I am a huge person. So the more I sit on this couch, the more I sit, sink into it. And consequently, the less you see of the cats when they sit on my knee. So I've been doing this for five years, like on this couch. So I'm basically, my butt is touching the floor at this point. But boom, different cat that you didn't expect that. An actual magic trick on a Magic the Gathering channel. That's the Hollywood magic right there. Showbiz, folks. But anyway, I got to go ahead and start talking about the Stompy deck. Not only because I've got a lot to say about it, but because I know for a fact a lot of people are really excited for it. This deck crushed the Patreon poll, embarrassed every other deck on the ballot, except for Mono Black Aristocrats. The only thing even close to it. But I know the excitement level is high amongst my patrons for it. And I had someone whose opinion on magic I really, really trust and respect on Twitter message me and tell me like, Dev, you better be serious about this Mono Green Stompy deck. It's my favorite archetype of all time, throughout all across all formats, so I will play standard if this deck is good. You better be serious about it, though. So all of that excitement has kind of prompted me to spend a lot more time than I usually do on this deck, making sure it's in the exact right shape before I present it to you. Not only that, but I do feel that there is something to this deck on a competitive level, more so than a lot of the decks that I present. Do I think it's the best deck in standard? No. We'll talk about those matchups a little bit later, but do I think it's got a lot going for it? Absolutely yes, especially after the arena season reset and it kicked me back into the high silver and gold tiers. This thing got me to platinum within a day. It just mows through the lower tiers of arena and has even been doing work in the platinum tier for me. That's because raw power is sometimes the best way to approach any given format, and this Stompy deck has proven that that might be a reality in the standard we live in right now. So, really can't waste any more time. We've already been here for like three minutes, and I haven't told you a single card in the deck, so let's get to it. Yo, I'm sort of do some heinous haters like a poopa scoopa. I'm just trying to take my life like a Koopa Troopa. I'm double Mario. That mean I'm super super. And I'm freaking dangerous like a Chupa Chupa Cabre. Got them all day like a Kanye, but I'm way better. Getting cheddar in Monterey. But Jack, you don't know, man. You got the show, man. You want roast beef? Well, I'm Arby's. And we're back on the other side of the intro. Wasn't that a good intro? And there's finally no cat in front of me, so you can tell this is a Bulbasaur shirt. But anyway, I gotta go ahead and start talking about the actual card choices in this deck. Because there's a lot of ways to go about building Stompy right now. And I'm not sure there's a correct way, but the list that I ended up on definitely is the list that ended up giving me the most wins. So that's the one I went with, and that, kind of surprisingly, involves playing Yumori the Collector as our companion. Now, at first glance, I know Yumori looks a little bit weird and just downright wrong, right? Because there are a few cards you can probably think of off the top of your head that are neither creatures nor lands, but we probably want to play in the main deck. I've tested them. We'll get to them a little bit later once we get to the sideboard. We'll talk about it. But for now, I just want to talk about the impact of Yumori as our companion. Now, as usual, companions are free cards. And this just gives us a four drop every single game that makes everything we cast afterwards a little bit easier to cast, depending on the creature. But for the most part, we've got a ton of creatures in this deck that this lowers the cost of and very often leads to us being able to play two pretty fat creatures the turn after we play a Yumori, which is huge. But all that said, I actually don't want to spend too much time talking about Yumori because at the end of the day, it's kind of one of the worst creatures in the deck. Now, I did not say it's a bad creature. It's just that we have so many ridiculous big boys in this deck that even a good creature like Yumori ends up being not too impressive when compared to a creature like Questing Beast. Now, I'm playing all four copies of Qbert here, even though it's legendary, because this is actually like one of the two best cards in the deck by kind of a wide margin. Questing Beast is still unbelievably good, and I'm amazed that more people aren't playing with this card right now. Just 
eats planeswalkers alive like it's nobody's business. Plus, it attacks through all these small creatures that decks like Lurus are playing right now. Not to mention Mono Red decks, Rakdos Knights, and a bunch of other small ball aggro decks. This just breezes right through while staying up to block anything that they might swing in with. It is the ultimate equalizer in aggro games, but even against control decks, this will eat a fair number of Teferis and Narsets while still getting through at the opponent. And they can't really do anything about it because they can't like block it with a birth of Melodus Wall or anything. This is a very, very good creature right now and it kind of always has been and I feel like people are forgetting that. That's a grave mistake. Questing Beast is again one of the two best cards in this deck hands down. But the reason that I keep backing off of calling Questing Beast the best creature in the deck, like unequivocally, is because we're also playing three copies of Karuga in the deck. Ooga, Karuga, that's how I feel about it. It turns out you don't have to play Companions as your companion. I think too many people are hung up on doing that. You're just playing in the main deck and it's totally fine. It's to totally fine and Karuga is just a filthy card in a mono green stompy deck. We've got so many things that cost three or more mana in this deck that sometimes you'll play your Karuga on turn five, turn six, something like that, and you just draw three cards. <laughs> that kind of restock, that kind of refill in a in a what is effectively an aggro kind of mid range aggro deck on turn five or six is just brutal and no opponent wants to deal with it. In the few days that I've been playing Karuga in this deck, I've had more people scoop to simply resolving Karuga than doing pretty much anything else in the week and a half I've been testing this deck. Karuga just hitting the board and drawing you a number of cards usually ends the game before you even hit your next attack step. I know that the consensus is that like Jeskai Fires is the deck for this card, and it probably is. That's a good thing to be doing. But I think people have kind of stopped there and not really explored anything else you can do with Karuga. Huge mistake. If there is one reason that you end up building and playing with this deck, it should be because Karuga's in it. And I want you to experience drawing three cards when you play your Karuga and you already have a decent board state. It usually tilts opponents into scooping right then and there, but even if it doesn't, you are highly favored to win that game at that point, at least in my experience. I've only been playing Karuga for a few days in this deck, and the deck was already good enough, but since I've added Karuga, the deck's win percentage has freaking skyrocketed. So I really want you to try this deck if for no other reason than you get to play Karuga in Mono Green Stompy. It's way better than you can possibly imagine. Oh, by the way, one more thing. This actually works kind of nicely when you already have a Yumori on the battlefield for a couple of reasons, right? Because before you play your Karuga, you have more efficient use of your mana thanks to Yumori. That allows you to play out, you know, multiple creatures in the same turn a lot more easily so that when you do play your Karuga, you draw more cards. Conversely, for that matter, once you do play your Karuga, you draw two, three cards, Yumori allows you to have a little bit more mana to use to actually play the cards that you drew. So there's going to be turns in the relative mid-game where you're able to play Karuga, draw two cards, and since you have a Yumori out, that allows you to play at least one of the creatures that you drew, and that is a huge, amazing turn. Play this card! Play this card, but anyway, if we're going to play both Yumori and Karuga, that means that we have to play a fair number of big old duders. But again, Mono Green has like no shortage of these big, big men, big, big old ladies. So with that in mind, we're going to play three copies of Cavalier of Thorns because this is a crazy card. This It's just, it's still good. I remember somebody tweeting out um, a pro, but I can't remember who it was and I don't want to say it and be wrong, but somebody just tweeted out the other week like, um... Anybody ever beat a Cavalier of Thorns? <laughs> it's because it is, it is really, really tough. This blocks, kills, and survives against pretty much anything. It also has reach, which a lot of people forget. Like, a lot of people forget this has reach and just swings into it. Don't count on it happening, but it does happen a lot. And if it ever does die, you're pretty much bound to get something juicy out of your graveyard. So you really don't mind making trades when it's time to make trades. So this card is just, like, unbelievably statted and almost always leads to, you know, not card advantage, but at least replacing itself when it does die, and sometimes with something even better. So, I mean, if you're looking for, like, what's the other best 5-drop, it's easily Cavalier of Thorns for this deck. But you want to know the other good 4-drop to play in this deck? Nullhide Ferox, which quickly went from a 4-of to a 2-of. I just wanted to try this card out, because that first line of text may as well not even exist, because we're not playing non-creature spells in the main deck. Anyway, so, I just wanted to try this thing out. But, again, we've got Yumori the Collector 
as our companion. So we've got a guaranteed four drop every game. Turns out we didn't want all these four drops going up our hand and making our decisions difficult on turn three or four. So that said, I cut it down to two copies, but I'm still playing some because it turns out that a four mana six six sort of expert is still a ridiculous deal. It always has been. This is an amazing threat that attacks very well, but blocks well when you needed to do that too. This is a steal at the mana cost. And again, in this deck, it's effectively a free roll. So I'm sticking with at least two copies of Ferox in the main. But we're not done with huge guys, because I'm also playing a copy of King Kong in the deck. Old, Co old Donkey Kogla over here. This is just it's a great card. I'm seriously thinking about adding a third copy to the deck. I just don't really know what to cut at this point. But Kogli is just super strong. Like The problem with Kogli in this deck, if there is a problem, is that we actually, like, we're not playing any humans. <laughs> like, we're really not playing enough humans for that last ability to matter. And sometimes that last ability can be really, really important in some games, but you're pretty much never going to hit it. That said, a 6-mana six 7-6 seven, six that swings in and kills artifacts and enchantments is pretty good, and it's almost always going to take something out and stay on the battlefield the turn that it hits the table. So this is just a ridiculous creature, and another reason I wanted to build the deck was specifically to play Kogla. So, again, I'm thinking about boosting this up to three copies. have no idea what to take out, and I'm not actually sure that I want to play three six drops, <laughs> right? But there's a lot of cool situations where, like, you lose your Cavalier of Thorns, you put a Kogla back on top, right? <laughs> or just top decking Kogla. Kogla has literally never been bad a single time. So it's just a righteous creature that if you play it on curve, it's good. If you can ramp into it, it's good. If you top deck it, it's good. There's just never a bad time for Kogla. But we're not done with big dudes. This deck is all big dudes, but let's go a little bit lower on the curve here. Talk about some three drops. Starting with three copies of Yorvo. I always want to say his name like that. Like it's like a a mountain called Yorvo, and I don't know why I'm inclined to do that, but obviously Yorvo is stacked. This is a good card, just based on stats alone. In this deck, it's going to get huge. Huge, they say. And again, just like I said uh, a little bit earlier, actually, did I or did I cut that part? We can, we do have a way to give this card trample in this deck. We actually have a way to give all of our huge dudes trample, which can be really valuable when you get your Yorvo to like a 10-10 which I've done a whole bunch of times. There's ways to do it in this thing. This kiss card just gets huge over the course of a game, and even if you just need it to block, it's there for you. It's there for you, son. The only actual issue I have with it is that its casting cost isn't actually reduced by Yumori, but that really is, that's not a big problem. That's not a problem. The best thing about the card is that often on turn three, and sometimes on turn two, you get yourself a 4-4 four, four that's only going to get bigger from there. Now, technically... I got another four drop to tell you about, but it's really a three drop, and very often it's a two drop. We're going to play four copies of Gem Razor. Oh, Razor Ramon right here. I've been calling him this card. So sick. There's a reason I put this card at number two in the set, in my set review. Uh, one of those reasons is because I'm a standard person, and I tend to weight standard cards more heavily than other cards, but it's also because the card is just like absolutely nasty. Card is very much brutal against pretty much any deck in the format right now. Whether it's busting up a Witch's Oven or an Elspeth Conquer's Death or a Fires of Invention, there are just so many different targets for this card the turn that it comes down. But if you do get it on turn two or three and you don't have anything to blow up, you also don't care because you get a 4-4 four, four, trample and reach that in a lot of situations is just going to get bigger. This is how we give all of our big dudes trample. <laughs> right? You put a Yorvo up underneath this, and then suddenly its base stats are 4-4, four, four, and it's got all the plus one, plus one counters that Yorvo previously had, and it's got Trample. That's how you get your Yorvo to a 10-10 in this deck. You're really getting Razor Ramon up to a 10-10 in that situation, but that can be insane. There's also a way in this deck to get a 4-4 four, four flyer on turn two with Trample, and a lot of opponents have also scooped to that situation, because what are you going to do about that if you don't have a removal spell? This is just a ridiculous card. <laughs> Whether or not it comes down on turn two, three, or... Even later in the game, you top deck it. You don't even want to mutate it. There's a lot of boards where that's been the case. You just play it as its own guy, you know? This is just an unbelievable card based on stats alone, especially for the mana cost. But it has so much to do in this format that it's often going to get you a righteous amount of value and a creature that your opponent can't immediately deal with. It effectively has haste if it mutates onto another big creature, so that can be insane. Sometimes blowing up a banishing light or a glass casket just forces scoops again 
because you get a big 4-4 guy plus whatever back that they glass casketed. There's just so many good things about Jim Razor in this format right now that I'm surprised it's only like a buck fifty and more people aren't talking about it. This card is good. That's all I got to say. <laughs> but believe it or not, it looks like there's not really much room left for them. But we are playing one and two drops in this deck. I know it sounds sounds like we're gonna like we're gonna be a Yorion deck, right? Are we playing eighty in here? No, we, we've got it. We got a tight sixty put together. Uh, but we still get to play two and one drops. So as far as the two drops go, we're gonna play four copies of Barkhide Troll and four copies of Paradise Druid here. Now Paradise Druid, amazing. This allows us to get to a Yumori on turn three, a Questing Beast on turn three, which is often a very good play especially if we win first a lot of people will scoop to that <laughs> just a third turn questing beast before they've even played their third land it's really really tough to deal with but obviously pelt or pelt collector we'll get to that in a second but paradise druid just ramps us into all of our big things and there's a ton of big things in the deck so this is an invaluable card plus if we get like paradise druid on turn two play a land on turn three we can just mutate a gem razor onto our paradise druid and suddenly we got a four four reach Trample Hexproof, and that's a pretty good card too, right? So, just Paradise Druid does everything in this deck, but Barkai Troll, I kind of have the, the complaint I have with Yorvo to where, like, the casting cost of this card isn't actually reduced by Yumori, and that's kind of feel bad, but everything else that it does is really good. You can mutate a Gem Razor onto this and effectively give it a form of Hexproof. Plus, again, Barkai Troll gets plus one, plus one counters, so that Gem Razor is going to be huge when you actually mutate it onto a troll. So that's something else really, really nice about troll in this deck, but it's just a good creature. Just on turn two, you get a three, three, and that is way bigger than a lot of like aggro decks can handle. And it's a decent threat to attack, you know, get the game started with some pressure. So I just really like Barkhide troll an awful lot. And it's a great two drop for the deck. But in terms of one drops, we're also playing four copies of Gilded Goose and three copies of Pelt Collector. Now I had to come down on one card and conventional wisdom states that you take out the worst card in the deck if you're looking to cut a card. It's either Barkhide Troll or Pelt Collector. I'm not actually sure. I ended up cutting the copy of Pelt Collector because I feel like it's more important to get a two drop like Barkhide Troll than it is to get a one drop like Pelt Collector. So take that as you will. If you had to cut any more cards uh, to fit any more things in, I'd probably take out one copy of Troll, but we can't mess up the early curve too much. We want to play a one drop. We want to play a two drop. And I didn't want to mess with that. But in the end of the, at the end of the day, I ended up with three Pelt Collector here because it really wasn't too much skin off our back to shave one Pelt Collector. It doesn't hurt too much. Much. However, when we do get Pelt Collector as our one drop, we can go Barkhide Troll or Paradise Druid, grow it on turn through two. Turn three, play a Yorvo or four drop from our Paradise Druid, grow it some more. Grows all the way to like seven, seven some of the time because Kogla's in the deck. Very often, as a matter of fact, there's a play where you play a Kogla with a Pelt Collector on the table, you kill something. Well, actually, let me back up. Kogla comes into play. Pelt Collector gets a plus one, plus one counter. Kogla fights and kills something but also dies. And then Pelt Collector grows again because Kogla died. That's a play that actually happens a fair amount of the time, depending on what Kogla fights. And that can be important to remember, too. A little bit of tech for you. But that said, Pelt Collector is not the most important thing in the deck. It is important, though, to remember that, again, this is yet another creature that gets plus one, plus one counters. So if you mutate a Gem Razor onto it, it can get real big or real quick. And it gets trampled once it gets a certain number of counters look out for that too that can be very important but anyway moving on from Pell Collector I have a lot to say about it for a card that's apparently the worst card in the deck but Gilded Goose I just could not cut a copy of you want all four copies of this it's great to be able to Gilded Goose turn one and then Gem Razor turn two it does end up in a tapped Gem Razor for a turn but who gives a crap at all who cares whatsoever it's just sweet to have a 4-4 flying trample on turn two son so that's a pretty good play right there but again this ramps us into pretty much anything this will ramp us into a turn two Yorvo very nice play. This will ramp us into, let's say, if we go Gilded Goose turn one, Paradise Druid turn four, we get a five drop on turn three, which can be unbelievable. Playing a Cavalier of Thorns on turn three is something a lot of decks aren't prepared for. So this isn't a ramp deck, not quite, but we do need a little bit of ramp because all of our best creatures are relatively high up on the curve. We want to get to them before our opponent is prepared for them. Now here are your lands. Fairly simple, right? I shouldn't even have to explain this. Just play all four copies of Castle Garen Brick, though. Just do that. You'd be surprised how often that, that extra one mana is, like, all you need to just completely decimate your opponent. <laughs> this deck really needs its mana because it's looking to play a huge creature on pretty much every turn. So don't discount how good Castle Garen Brig is. You don't got them. You don't have to play them. But it's actually... 
In terms of mana production, maybe one of the best cards in the entire deck. It helps more than you might think. But let's take a look at the sideboard real quick, and this is where I get to talk about non-creature stuff, because in case you're a little iffy on the rules of this, if you play a companion, then your main deck has to fulfill that companion's restrictions, but your sideboard is not restricted to those same restrictions. Now, here's the deal. If you side out Yumori in, in games two and three, you can side in any of these cards, like Shadow Spear, or Vivian, or the Great Hinge, it's totally fine. If you keep Yumori as your companion for game two or three, you cannot side in any of these cards. But if you're looking for a little bit of card advantage, things like Vivian, the Great Hinge, and Nylea can all be great side-ins. Originally, I was playing Vivian and the Great Hinge in the main deck here. But, especially once I decided that Karuga was a card I wanted to play, it was a lot easier to put these cards into the sideboard. Again, it's nice to have a beat stick like Karuga that also draws cards. Cards like the Great Hinge soak up our mana on a card that is not a threat. Yes, it keeps us in the game a little bit longer, but that's not something Stompy's usually interested in. Stompy is interested in closing the game, and by the time you're actually able to play a Great Hinge, you usually don't need the extra mana so much. So two-thirds of what the card does actually aren't that important in a lot of games for Stompy. But if you do find a game where you're either going to be low on your life total or you need to draw more cards than usual because you know the game is going to go longer than you want it to, a card like the Great Hinge can be great because it doesn't feel like taking a turn off to not play a creature. Same is true of Vivian. Now, Vivian does make a creature the turn that she comes down, but mostly we want this as kind of a green experimental frenzy for creatures. And it does function pretty well in that role, but again, I wanted to play Yumori as a companion and have a free card on turn four that reduces the cost of our big guys more than I wanted Vivian, which does feel a little bit clunky in the five drop slot. But again, you want a more card advantage, Vivian is where to go. So in slogs, sort of mid-range mirrors or against decks like Fires, for instance, where card advantage is very, very important. You're in a race for cards against that deck. Vivian can be a very important card to play. But also keep in mind that a five drop that doesn't actually put much power on the board compared to our other five drops isn't necessarily where we want to be in game one when speed is our number one priority. Now, as far as the only other non-creature card in the sideboard of the entire 75, it's Shadow Spear. This can be yet another way to give our creatures trample, which can be surprisingly incredible important just so you know but it's also a good card to race these aggro decks or you know not just mono red but like the mono black aggro deck that's sort of making the, the climb up to mythic matter of fact last i checked the mono black aggro deck that's currently seen play was number one mythic but that was like two days ago but if you run up against that deck which plays shadow spear <laughs> mind you shadow spear can be a great you know thing to have to sort of match up against their rotting regisars and whatnot so i really like shadow spear to help win races but we really don't need too much help against aggro to begin with that said, Trample is very important. Shadow Sphere is a very, very low-cost card. I like it a lot, but as far as the creatures in the sideboard here, we've got Nylea, again, aforementioned, mostly for card advantage. Uh, but it can be a big creature, too. Shifting Ceratops against the blue decks. Now, I was playing Destiny Spinner as well. Destiny Spinner did not really impress me that much, and I didn't really play against much Flash. Um, in the week that I've been testing this deck, which is insane. If you go first, Destiny Spinner can be a great card against Flash, um, I would imagine. <laughs> but Shifting Ceratops is always incredibly impressive against not only that deck, but a litany of decks playing blue in this format right now. Shifting Ceratops is an unbelievable four drop. You want to side that in against pretty much any deck that has islands in it. So aside from that, Stone Cold Serpent is the only other card in the sideboard. This is very, very good against Teferis. But it also does a few other things. If we side Side in Vivian, for instance, this is kind of a niche tech play, but that's one of the reasons you come to the channel. We side in Vivian and Stone Cold Serpent is on the top of our library. It's possible to just play it for zero. We can do that to get to the next card on top of our library if we're looking for something specific. So that's one thing. There's a cool, a few cool things you can do with the Stone Coil Serpent in this deck, but mostly it's good against things like Definite Clarion and Teferi, so it's a decent card against the Fires decks. But here are your power rankings. Final score of 68. That is a very, very high score. It's because the deck is raw on power. Very high on speed, especially in games where you get to go first. Can really make the difference in any game of Magic with any deck that you're playing. But this deck is very hungry to go first. Doesn't mean that it auto-loses when it goes second. But still, this deck really wants to go first. And when it does, it can be blindingly, deceptively fast if it gets the correct start. So... Keep that in mind. As far as synergy, we get a little bit of points because we have some deck building restrictions we have to fulfill for Yumori, right? But it's really not that high in the synergy department. In terms of resiliency, it's not great, but Karuga can be a very resilient piece. Plus we have Cavalier of Thorns in 
in there to get cards back when it dies, you know, cards that replace themselves. Um, Kogla can be a great top deck to get that thing off the board and have a huge creature. You know, that's resiliency in a way because it swings the game in your favor. Same thing's true of Gem Razor. You know, there are going to be boards where the game looks bleak. The game looks bleak for you. You draw a Gem Razor, you're able to kill that Fires of Invention or that Banishing Light or whatever. Get your thing back if it was Banishing Light. You have a 4-4 Trample on the battlefield, and that just really swings the pendulum of advantage into your favor quickly. So that counts as resiliency. But at the same time, we don't have all the ways in the world of drawing cards game one. So we're not that resilient. We don't have really any ways of getting stuff back from the graveyard. That's not really resilient either. But there's plenty of big, splashy plays that can swing the game in our favor. So we do have some resiliency. Apart from that, the offense is very high, but the defense is very low. Outside of Kogla, all we're really looking to do to neutralize our opponent's creatures is play bigger creatures. And there are a ton of creatures in this format that don't really care about attacking, like Priests of Forgotten Gods or Mayhem Devil. Those will, in some cases, never attack. They'll just kill us <laughs> from their side of the table without having to swing in. So we need a little bit more removal at some times in this deck. But for the most part, we're just looking to run the opponent over with our creatures so we're not as concerned with defense. A good offense is the best defense in this deck's case. But I said before the end of the video that I'd get into some of the matchups. So what I did was, the last day that I play-tested this deck, I wrote down um, all the games that I played and what we won and lost. Now, we, uh, we have 15 games all recorded right here. And the thing is, we ended up that day with a 66% win percentage. Now, I'm not going to lie to you, this is where a lot of YouTubers, a lot... A depressing number of YouTubers would put that in the title and the thumbnail 66% win rate get to mythic easy peasy or whatever um, I'm gonna be honest with you I think that some of these games that we won are not actually great matchups to be honest with you uh, but I'm still gonna run through all the things that we won and lost we beat the Jeskai Lura cycling deck but I think that that is a, a fairly bad matchup if I'm being 100% honest with you we beat that deck because it got stuck on three lands and couldn't zenith flare us I think is what happened there but they did get stuck on lands I don't think that the cycling deck is a very good matchup for this deck we beat Azorius Flyers we beat Red Black Knights we beat Mono Red three times which is actually pretty typical uh, almost any small aggro deck is a very very good matchup for this deck because we outclass all of their creatures really really quickly and traditionally throughout the years decks like this that play big creatures fast have been very good against aggro decks of pretty much any stripe and that very much proved true in testing we also beat the, beat the mono black aggro deck that i was just talking about the one that plays like rotting registrar a bunch of whisper squad knight of the ebon legion a bunch of one drops and it plays like heraldic banner Right. In case you haven't seen that deck, it's actually one of the better decks in the format right now. And I want to play it on camera soon. I really like that deck. I think we're about even with them. In terms of aggro decks, I think that's probably the best one against us. But I still think we evenly win that match. We beat a Doom Foretold deck. Gem Razor is very, very good. We beat another Mono Green deck. This one playing Vivian's in the main and the Great Hinge in the main. So if that tells you anything. And uh, we beat a Red Black Sacrifice deck. I don't think that's a very good matchup either. I've already talked about Priest of Forgotten Gods. If we get enough creatures on the battle, field priest really doesn't matter but priest can be very very annoying we also beat a jeskai fires deck twice but i don't think that's a great matchup we did lose to jeskai fires <laughs> in a match as well and we also lost to four color yorion fires so i don't think that fires is a great matchup especially in game one for us we lost to winota and giruda meaning that we're not great against decks that just win the game on turn four <laughs> you know, decks that have an I win button, um, first of all, are falling out of favor. Winota and Garuda are decks I don't play against as often as I did at the beginning of the season. They don't place as often in the standings as they did at the beginning of the season, especially Garuda, which is really on its way out. But decks that do play that, like, turn four, I win if you can't do anything about it. We're technically pretty bad against those decks in a lot of cases, especially if we don't go first. And finally, we lost a game to Jun Sacrifice. Uh, funny that we picked up one against Red Black um, and lost one to Jund, and I think we're probably better against Jund, to be honest, because Jund usually has a, har a harder time uh, getting its mana, assembling its pieces, and it has more pieces to assemble than the Red Black Sacrifice deck. You know, it has to take turns off playing thing like things like um, Gilded Goose and the Trail of Crumbs. And usually we're they're dead <laughs> if they if they take the turns off doing that. But we did end up losing a game to uh, to Jun Sack. But winning one against Red Black Sack. And honestly, the way those matchups are positioned, I think that the matchups are switched. We should we should have beaten Jun Sack and lost against Red Black Sack. But again, Red Black Sack is effectively an aggro deck, especially the way it's built now with Luris and all the two drops. Often doesn't even play Mayhem Devil, and we're very very good against that setup. 
all things considered. So we do have some good and bad matchups in the deck or with the deck. Um, fires, especially the Yorion Fires deck, the Karuga Fires deck, both of those I think may be the best decks in the format. Uh, Bant Yorion, another one of the best decks in the format that we amazingly did not play against, that I think we probably have a bad matchup against. So all of these kind of mid-ranger controly decks like Fires and uh, Yorion, I feel like our matchups aren't great against, but that said, if it's like small ball aggro you're having a problem with, or other sort of fair mid-range decks in the format, I think you've got a really, really good shot with this deck. This is one of those decks that, again, I don't think it's the absolute best deck in the format, given the bad matchups that it does have, are against some of the actual best decks in the format, but if you're playing against a lot of aggro, or, you know, an aggro deck gets popular in the format again. I think this is a deck that you really want to explore. And honestly, even if Fires is something you're playing against a lot, I still think this is a deck you should explore the possibilities of. Because Mono Green really impressed me and was a much better deck than I initially thought it was going to be. But anyway, that's it for this one. I will be playing with this deck on camera as soon as tomorrow. I want to get in some games with this thing and really show you what it can do, show you what it's got and all that. But I want to be doing a lot of playing on camera in the next week to kind of make up for the slow trickle of content over the last seven days. So hopefully you'll see a little bit more of me around these parts and we'll play some magic together. But in the interim, please do try and put this deck together, get in some games and see how you like it. Because I, again, was very much more impressed with this deck than I ever thought I was going to be when I first initialized the concept. But in any case, give it a shot. If you want to check it out, there's a deck list in the description of TCG Player. Anything you order through that deck list will help me out tremendously, but you don't have to spend any money. Just hit the like button and subscribe to the channel if you want to support me for absolutely no money cost. But hey, if you want to support me the best way you possibly can for less than the price of buying an entire deck, just hit the link to Patreon down there in the description or go to patreon.com slash spmtg. Dollar a month is all it takes to vote on what content we even do around here so you get to control a YouTuber that you quite like. That Imagine the power. So <laughs> click the link in the description, go to Patreon, help you do it out. Even if you can't, I'm just happy that you're here. I'm just happy that you're giving me the views. I need those too. I appreciate you actually thinking I got something to say. <laughs> in any case, I guess I'm done for this one. Just let me know how you felt about it down there in the comments section. Again, I know that it's like slightly strange looking to play Yumori, not play Vivian in the main deck, not play Great Hinge in the main deck. But again, this deck is all about raw offensive power and it does not want to take turns off, even in the mid and late game, playing cards like that. So you don't have to take my word for it. Test it out however you want. But try out my version. See how it does. Karuga is ridiculous. Questing Beast is still an amazing card. People tend to have forgotten that. So give the thing a shot. Let me know how you feel. Comment down there in the sideboard. But anyway, I guess I'm done for this one. So am I going to catch you? Am I actually done talking? Holy crap. I always feel like there's like a five minute thing here where I have to babble at you. But I think I've actually succinctly, precisely gotten all of my points across in this video. How did that happen, Ziggy? Holy crap. Anyway, I'll catch you guys later. I'm Dev from The Place. Thanks for watching, my wizards. Spread love. Oh my god, and be kind. <laughs>